we'll talk about uh, direct georeferencing now. So it's um, talking about um, LiDAR, um, photogrammetry, and the difference between the two. Um, so I've I've just named it um, with a big sort of name. So it's it's a bit hard to swallow, but it's uh, named the benefits of direct georeferencing for simultaneous LiDAR photogrammetry systems versus traditional aerial triangulation systems. Um, so basically, comparing direct georeferencing systems with the more traditional photogrammetry um, systems. So um, to go back to the, the sort of direct georeferencing term, I've just extracted a, um, a little um, picture from um, one of the Aplanix document. Um, so here you have uh, two diagrams that display aerial triangulation versus uh, direct georeferencing. Basically, aerial triangulations, um, it's, it's sort of an upward um, uh, workflow. So you're identifying ground control points uh, on the uh, images. Uh, this could be images or LiDAR point cloud, whatever. You're identifying ground control points and tie points. And this, with the aerial triangulations, you reposition your platform, uh, not only the position of your platform, but also the orientation of your platform from those type points and ground control points. And then you can generate your auto photos and so on. So you sort of look at this and you find out what was going on there. Whereas uh, the direct georeferencing process, um, because you're using high-grade IMUs, um, the surveyors has a, a Planix APX15 in it, so you're uh, down to uh, sort of centi-degree uh, accuracy in roll and pitch and, and heading. So you're able to actually get um, full accuracy of your position and orientation of your uh, platform. And therefore, you're able to actually position accurately each point of your LiDAR or photogrammetry pixel. So this gives you the ability to quickly uh, georeference any sort of points because you, they're already georeferenced and you can just position your data basically. Um, so now that we've sort of introduced the two methods, uh, we'll look at the case study in, in more details. Um, we are talking about a query site um, south of France, which was uh, just west of Monte Carlo. Um, it's a small query, um, 25 hectares coverage. Uh, you're talking about fairly um, high steep walls um, because the terrain is, is sort of rugged. So um, the, the, the sort of use of, of this kind of data enables the, um, the, the, the sort of operator to do quarterly basis maps, volumetric calculation, anything that a query would do to actually do infrastructure developments or other such. Um, so this was the area uh, where we deployed um, our survey methods. Same day with the same weather conditions, um, exactly the sort of the same hour slots. We um, deployed three methods. Um, so one was um, a terrestrial LiDAR system. Uh, that was a Trimble TX5. So mounted on a tripod. Uh, so this was really sort of land survey, uh, traditional, um, but with a scanner. We uh, also deployed a uh, photogrammetric um, sensor, a fairly um, widely commercially available um, sensor, um, the DJI Inspire, with a 16 megapixel camera on it. And uh, at the same time, we had our um, surveyor um, mounted in combo with a, with a camera, which is a Sony Alpha 6000. So a little bit higher um, resolution in terms of uh, megapixel. And the uh, sensor, which um, like the direct georeferencing sensor, which will then position images and LiDAR points. This was mounted on a Onyx Star Altigator um, platform, um, which enabled us to do all the, um, the flight width. So this um, platform was used in, um, in the trajectory was corrected after the flight, so in sort of PPK mode. Um, but we'll see that a bit later. In terms of um, the operation and how we, um, we can sort of do the difference between the two, um, 
the terrestrial LiDAR system to deploy, it's a little bit um, tricky. You sort of need to be a bit more specialist because there's a lot of, um, of network set up to do initially. So you need to uh, have a checkerboard set up in, in order to actually position your tripod and then to have absolute positioning um, reference to the uh, scanner. And then you need um, to actually move around with uh, a few reflective spheres to actually relay your station from one to the other. So there's a lot of movement and a lot of moving parts around uh, a terrestrial LiDAR uh, scanning uh, survey. Then in terms of um, DJI Inspire and the photogrammetry process, um, the, 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 operate, the operative uh, constraints are fairly uh, simple. Uh, in terms of flight planning, it's sort of a no-brainer, it's very accessible. Um, the only thing that you need to do pre-flight is just having a network of ground control point and targets in order to actually shoot them from the drone and then being able to visualize them on your acquisition. So this takes a bit of uh, time and effort to deploy. And uh, on the other side, uh, you have the, um, the yellow scan surveyor combo mounted. Um, this only requires a base station to be uh, deployed. Uh, you'll see that in the, in the field this afternoon. Uh, base station recording atmospheric corrections and observations. Um, so you have a, a GNSS base station reading, but not in direct visual line of sight with the drone. So you don't, you're not talking RTK, you're just talking PPK. So you can be five kilometers away, you'll still get good corrections results. Um, so one um, PPK base station and the flight plan needs to be um, taking consideration of the range of the scanner. So that's a little bit more constraining than the photogrammetry because you need um, the scanner has a, bit, has a limited range. So you need to sort of adapt your uh, flying altitude to the terrain. In terms of um, timing now and uh, during the operations, um, you still have the, uh, the three methods displayed there, and uh, vertically you have um, field operation, field survey time spent uh, directly in the field, uh, we were talking, and the surface covered. Then you have the sort of product that was generated out of it, so this is in terms of how much data was generated uh, with the tools. Then you have um, manual processing time, uh, so like, literally clicking buttons and, uh, and manipulating softwares. And then uh, machine processing time, so sort of um, basically no operator, just machine processing. Uh, at the end, you have the different products that uh, we got from these data sets, uh, so the, the proper products. And then with the arrows, you have the sort of, we could call it the coverage production rate, if you want. So actors per hours here. Uh, you can see that um, the TLS, uh, terrestrial LiDAR system, uh, took about six hours in the field to cover one hectare. Um, this was a lot of moving. Uh, we did about 22 stations, so moving spheres around and everything. So this took quite a long time. Uh, six hours was uh, sort of necessary to actually cover the 25 hectares of the quarry. So this was 10 flights, um, plus it, had, it was pretty constrained with, um, with the sort of luminosity that was uh, occurring at the uh, quarry side, so there was like appropriate time slot for him. So he actually did it in two days. Um, so three hours the first day and three hours the second day. Uh, generated six gigabit of images, um, and then we'll we'll look at the workflow afterwards. Uh, two hours was uh, sufficient for the for the surveyor. Uh, just four flights because you basically just need to cover one flight path, and you get the results out of one flight path. You don't need multiple flight paths to actually get a good coverage um, because the field of view of the scanner is uh, is 360 degrees. You get quite a lot of points that are um, mapping vertical surfaces as you fly through. So it's, it's a really good point with that scanner. Um, the um, photogrammetry that was taken from that uh, sensor, um, we, uh, we did um, shots on a time-lapse sort of sequence and generated uh, six gigs of data that we processed uh, two ways. Um, one way we processed 
as a direct Jira referencing um, uh, workflow. So we just kept it uh, image timed and looked at the parameters of the IMU and georeferenced it directly from that. And the other way is we used those images because they were a bit higher resolution. And we um, did some uh, traditional aerial triangulation structure for motion algorithm uh, with that. So um, two ways with the images taken from, uh, from the LiDAR. So basically, at the end, you get a product from the TLS, one hectare, with a ground sampling distance of one centimeter. Um, so this gives you a sort of coverage uh, production rate of 0.1 hectare per hour. Um, then the um, yellow scan images that were processed with the aerial triangulation, uh, where uh, you see the processing time with 24 megapixel is quite different with the uh, processing time of a 16 megapixel camera. So it took about 40 hours. Um, this was with uh, SFM softwares. Uh, and generated this product with a ground sampling distance of two centimeters. And the um, sort of standalone uh, DJI Inspire generated this ground sampling distance of 10 centimeters. And the uh, LiDAR generated this product. So colorized because we had the image uh, in direct georeferencing and with a ground sampling distance of five centimeters. So in terms of production um, coverage ratio, you can say, um, the survey is quite uh, dominant because it, it really, the reason comes from this only single passage that you require to actually um, do your, um, your flight path. So in terms of uh, now there's different um, there's different sort of comparison uh, criteria you can uh, you can choose, but basically we've compared it different ways uh, with absolute accuracy assessment, looking at just control points and uh, validation points, and trying to compare the um, the error, uh, so the spread of the known points with the lighter points or the photogrammetry points. Um, this gives you a sort of spread of the error. So this is just descriptive statistics of the shift between known points and, uh, and the sort of model points. Um, basically, the um, aromacy, which is the sort of accuracy estimator, which is fairly commonly used, gives you a uh, aromacy of uh, 4.5 centimeters for the scanner, which is just sort of not too far from the RMSC of, um, of those um, photogrammetric product. So you're not getting that much more accuracy with, with the LiDAR sensor. But what's interesting to see is that if you're talking about a wider area, if you're talking about a sort of not only a point-by-point -point basis, but if you're talking cloud-to-cloud -cloud differences, um, now the differences are, are quite significant. So we took a little sort of parcel of, uh, of ground that was extracted with a fairly sort of steep curve. So you have a, you have a sort of slope changes that are quite sharp uh, here and here. And we took the TLS as a reference. And we basically compared the TLS with the photogrammetric and the, um, the survey LIDAR product. And these are the results of the uh, statistical comparison. The, um, Yellow scan um, sort of point cloud difference shows this. Um, the DJI Inspire shows this. And this is the uh, 24 megapixel from the surveyor. So you can see the two sort of um, surveyor LiDAR and the high rate um, imagery shows a bit similar stuff uh, in terms of accuracy. Um, it's just that apparently this was shifted a little bit. So you get a bit of a constant shift to the data set. But what's interesting here is to look at this product and you're starting to see those sort of um, errors creeping in exactly at the sort of slope changes of, uh, of, the, um, of this area. So that's where most of the error will be. So at the brutal uh, slope changes of the, uh, of, of the area. So the sort of aerial triangulation uh, process works well, but not really at um, slope changes uh, artifact. You'll, you'll generate a lot of artifact there. And now in a more sort of visual um, sort of section by section comparison, um, 
just to give you uh, other sort of differences between the, uh, the different methods that we used, um, this is still the DJI um, 16 megapixel product. This is the yellow scan uh, surveyor product. This is a cross section, 20 centimeter cross section. You see the sort of penetration difference that you get from vegetation um, and ground points. Still, it's not a perfect system, so you still get sort of holes under the vegetation when it's too dense, but you still capture a lot more information on the ground, especially in some areas. Plus, in the sort of canopy features that you can see and depict uh, with the LiDAR sensor. So this is one visual, there's other visual that we can look at uh, and that just tells you how the difference looks like um, from the same sort of scale, same point of view. Uh, you see the sort of uh, dropping effect on, uh, on the, the data set uh, linked to the uh, photogrammetry while you don't really have the same in, in, in the LiDAR. So the LiDAR is, because it's an active measurement, you're able to actually um, transit your LiDAR beam directly to the object, while the uh, photogrammetry is, is a bit trickier. Same thing with, uh, with uh, slope changes again, um, and this will be um, sort of described a bit further with another presentation um, tomorrow, but you get this sort of, um, wavy features when your resolution is not too right. Um, so you get this sort of profile, which is not representative of the truth. The LiDAR will give you a sort of way more squarey uh, picture, which is what was the actual, uh, the actual what was in the crown. And then um, this is with the higher resolution camera. But what you see with the higher resolution camera is that you'll still be fairly um, detailed on the, on the shape of the object, but you could be influenced by the, the actual um, light conditions. So for example, this is some bulk bags that were stored on the platform, and you're getting shadows on some sides, so you're getting sort of no data on some of the sides. So this is just an example on a, on a sort of one meter feature, but it happened the same sort of things on, on the mine benches, basically, because you get shadow effects. In conclusion, um, basically this just summarized a little bit the key points of each method um, from still the TLS up to the uh, yellow scan surveyor. So in terms of production rate, we've seen that uh, ground sampling distance, uh, you can, this is the sort of figure you can expect from the scanner uh, in terms of uh, ground sampling distance. Accuracy, um, we've seen a few of those. Um, this is absolute accuracy measurement that we had from 27 uh, control points, and the uh, sort of cloud-to-cloud -cloud comparison that we uh, took uh, on that particular place. Uh, the key points, tedious for the TLS, um, sort of quick to deploy on the um, on the on the matrix, uh, the the DJI uh, Inspire. Sorry, uh, easy flying, but the need of ground sampling uh, of of ground control points all the time because you need some ground truth at some point. The yellow scan surveyor, you just need the base station to be located on the landmark, and then you can actually go from there, basically, and have a fairly good uh, uh, confidence on, on, the, uh, on the actual measurements. Benefits um, for the combo configuration versus aerial triangulation photogrammetry, uh, basically faster survey time, faster processing time. Um, you're getting your data at a way quicker rate. Uh, you're covering more in terms of, uh, of like area. Um, you need less uh, ground control points um, because you actually have a direct georeferencing system. You still will need it because you do reporting and you do quality uh, checks. So you'll still get some uh, uh, control points, but they're not really control points. They're more like validation points than anything else. Um, plus, with the uh, direct geofencing, you're getting all the benefits from a remote sensing um, advantage, uh, which means safe operation, wider field of view, and faster data collections. Um, also, the other benefits from LiDAR surveys, and we've seen a few sort of sc screenshots of it, uh, which was vegetation penetration, um, the fact that it was an active light, so you're getting actual uh, measurements of each point. 
and also the fact that you can be um, fairly confident on um, redundant measures. So repeatability of the measure will give you um, good results, uh, while the sort of photogrammetry is fairly much light dependent, so you sort of influenced by that parameters, which is not really the case with, with LiDAR. Um, and of course, the fact that you can capture very fine object, electric power line, electric power line sorry, is the sort of main example of, of a go and no go between LiDAR and photogrammetry. So there you go. <laughs>